Hello everybody. On behalf of Veteron Institute for Research and uh, Social Change, we would like to welcome you all to our new vidcast series called On Precarity. I'm Kostas Gousis and I'll be presenting uh, this series with uh, Ageliki Karagiorgou. In each episode, uh, we will be discussing books and uh, uh, reports on uh, uh, capital labor relations, experiences of precarity and its effects uh, on the youth, as well as labor struggles against multiple forms of inequality. In the first episode, we're very glad uh, to have with us uh, Professor Guy Standing, uh, whose uh, award reference, whose uh, uh, books uh, have significantly contributed to all our topics uh, of uh, concern. Guy Standing has uh, worked for many decades at uh, the International Labour Organization and served as uh, the director of the Socioeconomic Security Program of ILO. He's a professorial research associate at uh, SOAS University of uh, London and uh, a founding member and uh, honorary co-president of uh, the Basic uh, Income Earth uh, Network. Welcome, Professor Standing, and thank you very much for being uh, here with us today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, today's uh, discussion uh, is focused on Guy Standing uh, book entitled The Precariat, the New Dangerous uh, Class, uh, which uh, was published uh, last year in Greek uh, by Topos Publications and uh, Meta Institute. It is an internationally recognized book that has been uh, translated into 25 uh, languages. So uh, let's start uh, with uh, the first uh, question. Guy, uh, you have said many times uh, that uh, the precariat uh, is not just uh, insecure jobs. Would you like to describe to us the fundamental uh, characteristics uh, about this class? Yes, I mean, the, the precariat has emerged as a new class in the 21st century. <clears throat> and essentially what we've seen is that the neoliberal economic revolution of the 1980s and 1990s has produced a new model of capitalism. I call it rentier capitalism, in which more and more of the income flows to the owners of property, physical property, financial property, and intellectual property, and less and less goes to those who are performing labor and work. And in that context, what we've seen is finance, Financial capital has become the dominant force in the global economy. And in the process, a new globalized class structure has emerged. That cl class structure has a plutocracy at the top, an elite serving the interests of the plutocracy, a salariat of people in employment security with pensions and so on, and the old proletariat, the old working class of the 20th century is dying and shrinking. And still our politics on the center left and on the left have focused on the old proletariat. But really the new class is the precariat. And underneath the precariat, there's the lumpen or underclass, people dying in the streets with opioids and so on. The precariat is wanted by global capital. And it can be defined in three dimensions. The first dimension is what I call distinctive relations of production. That means that people in the precariat have unstable, insecure labor. They have uh, no occupational narrative to give to their life, no sense of becoming something. They're living bits and pieces lives. They have to do a lot of work that isn't counted, that isn't recognized, isn't remunerated. They have to do a lot of work for labor, work for the state, work for reproduction. And um, they have to experience something that has never happened before. And that is very important for the young, because this is the first time in history when a mass class has had to have a level of education greater than the level 
required for the jobs they can expect to obtain. It's a very, very distinctive situation. And ironically, many of the jobs are requiring higher levels of education credentials to obtain them, but actually don't need them in the actual performance of their labor. And this creates a great sense of frustration, alienation, and so on. The second dimension is that the period has to rely on low volatile money wages. It doesn't get non-wage benefits. It doesn't have access to rights-based state benefits. And it's losing the commons. The commons, which I've written about in the separate book, the commons belong to all of us and give a sense of solidarity and security to our societies. But they've been privatized, commodified, and depleted by austerity. The ironical thing is that because we're living in an age of rentier capitalism dominated by finance, the precariat is exploited by debt. And financial capital wants people to be in debt. That's how they make their money. So the precariat is living on the edge of unsustainable debt all the time. One accident, one illness, one mistake, they can be out in the streets. And this creates incredible stress, insecurity, mental illnesses, and deaths of despair. The third dimension is the most important of all. And that is the precariat has distinct relations to the state. And by then I mean that it's losing rights of citizenship. It's losing civil rights, it's losing social rights, it's losing cultural rights, it's losing economic rights, and it's losing political rights because politically there are not parties that systematically represent the precariat's interests and aspirations. And this leads to the most important defining feature of the precariat. They feel like supplicants. They feel they have to ask for favors all the time. They have to rely on discretionary judgments by landlords, by employers, by parents, by spouses, by their children in order to survive. And this is very undignifying and creates more stress, more feelings of inadequacy and a lot of anger. So these are the features that define the precariat and things flow from there. But the fact is that now around the world, an increasing proportion of our populations, including in Greece, including my own country, Britain, including countries like South Korea and Japan and Brazil and South Africa, millions of people feel they belong to the precariat. This is a global phenomenon. And every day I receive emails from somewhere in the world from somebody saying, I am in the precariat and your book is about me. And I was very impressed when I spoke in Athens with the Greek edition of the book. It's now gone into five editions. And uh, I believe that it's really relevant for the politics of the future in Greece. Thank you very much. Well, uh, after the publication of your book in 2011 and during the last decades, uh, a lot of debates took place uh, uh, about uh, the precariat and precarity as an analytical and political uh, question. Is there any feedback on your book uh, or any specific uh, criticism that you consider particularly constructive uh, in terms of pushing your discussion of the precariat further? Yes. Um, on, on page one of the book, as published in 2011, I said that unless the politicians and the analysts came to understand and analyze the precariat, we would see the emergence of a political monster. Those were the words I used in English, a political monster. And in early 2016, I received an email, very strange, 
asking me to go and address the Bilderberg Group. Now, the Bilderberg Group is the elite right wing movement set up after the Second World War, having right wing prime ministers, plutocrats, head of the CIA, head of MI6, head of NATO, and people like that. So I thought it was a joke from some friend of mine on the left. Then they called me up and said, no, we would really like you to come and address the Bilderberg Group. So in early 2016, I suddenly was addressing 100 people with several prime ministers, several ministers of finance, the head of NATO, the head of CIA, and so on. And right in front of me was Henry Kissinger. Now, all of these people I thought would have no interest in my dialogue on the precariat. But I said, look, do not be surprised if Donald Trump is elected president later this year, in November 2016. Do not be surprised if in Britain they vote for Brexit because you're not having a policy agenda that responds to the insecurities of the precariat. And part of the precariat will vote for populist, neo-fascist agendas. And sure enough, of course, Donald Trump won in November 2016, and I received numerous emails and messages from people who said, your political monster has arrived. Now, since then, I have been asked to speak many times on the links between the growth of the precariat and our shift of politics to a dangerous new far-right agenda. We see it in the latest case in the Netherlands, with the PVV and Wilders winning against the expectations of the centre-left. We see it in Sweden, we see it in Scandinavia, we see it in France, we see it in, in Italy with Meloni and the Brothers of Italy, and we've seen it in Greece, of course. And the reason is that the precariat is split into three factions, three groups. And the first group consists of those who are not very educated. They haven't been to university and they come from communities of manufacturing communities, mining communities, construction communities, where the old working class, where the, the Papandreou constituents, for example, used to come from. And that group wants yesterday back. They have lost the past in their minds. And this group will listen to the neo-fascists and the populists who promised to bring back yesterday, promised sovereignty, national uh, identity, and all of these things, and play on the fear of people. And this group has been supporting the Donald Trumps and the various other groups that we, we all know about. But the second group in the precariat are what I call the nostalgics. These are people who are like the migrants, the refugees, the minorities, the people with disabilities. And they lack a present, a today, a home. And being nostalgic when they don't have a home, they are disenfranchised. They're losing a sense of home and reality today. This group won't support the neo-fascists, but they don't support anything because they don't see a future. And the third group in the precariat are mainly the young who went to university and to college and they were promised by their teachers and their parents that if they did that, they would have a future. They would have a career. They would develop themselves. And most of them come out of university feeling they bought a lottery ticket. 
A lottery ticket meant that only a few win and the rest are living with debt, with disillusion, disappointment. This group won't vote for neo-fascists, but they've been staying at home because they don't see a politics of paradise, as I've called it in the book. And this group is the group that typically invite me to go and speak to them in different countries. I've been giving talks in 42 countries so far, because it's this group that is now looking for a new progressive politics. And parties like Syriza, parties like Podemos, parties like Cinquez, Movimento Cinque Stella in Italy, they failed to do that. They have failed to provide a vision of a good society for the future. And until the left articulates a new progressive vision, we are in a very dangerous point where the activists, the first group, combined with other right-wing elements, will drag our politics to the far right. We are at a very, very dangerous point today, and it's vital that a new progressive politics develops. Uh, Guy, what was the impact of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic? I mean, we have seen a very strong and sharp transition to online and distance uh, working. What kind of labor market uh, is uh, shaping up uh, for the post-pandemic uh, precariat? Well, uh, thanks for that question. Um, you, you probably don't know, but I've just published a new book uh, that came out uh, two months ago. It's only in English at the, moment, <clears throat> at the moment. It's called Politics of Time, uh, Gaining Control in the Age of Uncertainty. I hope it will be translated into Greek one day, but it's partly due to COVID that I came to write this book. Because what COVID has done is make a lot of people realize that we are living with chronic uncertainty today. Now, uncertainty is a very particular form of insecurity. The old forms of insecurity that the welfare state was developed to deal with, like unemployment, illness, accident, pregnancy, old age, you can work out the probability of that happening and build a social insurance system to provide security. With uncertainty, you never know when you're going to be hit by a shock, by a hazard. You don't know if you are going to be hit and you don't know how hard you're going to be hit and whether you can cope with the problems and recover the problems. And I think COVID reinforced the feeling among millions of people that all of us are vulnerable. You, me, all of those listening are vulnerable to being hit by a shock that could cause us to have terrible circumstances. And this has reinforced my arguments for moving towards a basic income. And during COVID, I received uh, another request, very strange request, from a musical group called Massive Attack. You may have heard of Massive Attack. And Massive Attack asked me to make a musical video with my arguments saying that we need to recognize the precariat and to recognize we need to strengthen our sense of resilience our sense of being able to handle shocks and be able to feel confident that we will be able to recover from those shocks. And the musical video, you can find it on YouTube. It's been watched by over a million people, which is strange for an economist to experience this in many languages. And I get a lot of calls as a result. And I think that the COVID and the austerity era, the combined things, are making a lot more people feel we've got to move in the direction of giving everybody a basic security. 
everybody a basic income in which they can build their lives and feel a sense of control. And if you're in the precariat, that is the most important thing of all. That is the most important thing. And millions of people now are coming to realize it. And opinion polls in various European countries, even in the United States, shows that a majority now support moving in that direction. But our politicians, mainly, are dead men walking. They're dead men walking, unable to grab the initiative and have the courage to come up with a transformation gen agenda. And the political problems on the left will only continue unless they realize that they have to have a new agenda, which promises people a sense of security, a sense of freedom, a sense of social solidarity suitable for the 21st century. And I'm sorry to say that our mainstream parties on the center left and the left have failed. And again and again, they get defeated and they throw up their hands and they don't understand why they're defeated. But until they change their agenda and their vision, that defeat will continue. You will remember a famous saying back in 2015 by a certain politician who became your prime minister, who said defeat is the battle that is not waged. You remember him saying that? Well, he didn't fight the battle. He surrendered to the IMF. He surrendered to the, the, the trilogy or whatever you want to call it. He surrendered. He didn't fight the battle. And until we have brave politicians with a sense of vision who understand the precariat, that defeat will continue. Especially during the pandemic, we realize that we are all vulnerable. But uh, as another saying goes, uh, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. So I would like to ask you, how do you consider the unequal effects of precarity based on race, gender, age, and uh, which is the most productive way to overcome these divisions between groups within the precariat in order to have the broader alliance of uh, uh, the exploited uh, people? Yes, that's a very good question. And I've tried to address it in my new books. I think any transformation, any progressive uh, movement is always led by the interests and aspirations of the emerging new mass class. That class today is the precariat. It counts for 40% or whatever the percentage of the adult population, but something like that. And I think also that we realize we must have an agenda that reaches beyond the precariat and that unites the educated part of our populations, including people who are in the salariat, in secure employment, including people, some people who are progressive in their thinking, even further up in the economic uh, stratosphere, if you like. I believe that basic security is an essential component of that appeal across classes. I also believe that rebuilding the commons, rebuilding what is common to all of us, nature, the social commons, the cultural commons, the, the civil commons that is universal justice, these are what should be the elements of a new progressive agenda. And that means reversing privatization. It means reversing the commodification of life. It means decommodifying our education system. Our education system has been captured by the interests of a neoliberal ideology. It's for producing human capital. That's the term that is used. It's for making people more competitive, more uh, capable of making more money than the other people. 
It's a perversion of what the ancient Greeks regarded as the search for paideia, the sense of arete, the sense of moral education. This is the sort of agenda that we need to build. And I believe that will appeal across classes, but will help unite the various parts of the precariat. If we use a Marxian term, at the moment, the precariat is still a class in the making because it's internally divided. It knows what it's against, but it hasn't got a unified agenda. But I believe it's becoming a class for itself. And it will become a class for itself when the agenda reaches out towards all elements. The people I call nostalgics, they want basic security. They want a sense of a home. The agenda should appeal to them. The people in the atavistic part are responding because they are fearful. They fear for themselves, for their children, and they listen to voices promising some sort of security, but this is not a real security because the appeal is to make the other people the enemy the migrants, the women, the disabled, or whatever group it might be, they're the enemy. And the people like Trump have what we call in English, they use the dog whistle, which is always playing on an, a misogynist, racist, nat nativist language to appeal to the base instincts of people. And we need an agenda that appeals to the good instincts of people. And that I think is emerging slowly and painfully, but that's what we need. Uh, Guy, according to your book, Basic Income and the Revival of the Commons uh, are two possible solutions uh, to change the current situation for the precariat. Based on your experience uh, in uh, the pilot programs, uh, projects, uh, how do you see the precariat uh, benefiting from such politics? Well, you're, you're listening to a man who's had a very privileged experience of being able to test and see the results from a policy that I've advocated for several decades. I've been fortunate to be able to design and participate in a number of basic income pilots. And the pilots have been in Africa, they've been in India, they've been in Brazil, they've been in Finland, they've been in Canada, the United States, England, and at the moment, there are over 100 basic income pilots going on. I'm Tomorrow, I'm being interviewed in Korea for a basic income pilot. Um, we're talking about a basic income pilot in Ukraine. And at the moment, I can tell you this. In every single pilot and experiment in which I participated, and I've written it up in my book on basic income, the results are essentially the same. And the results include this. Most importantly of all, having a basic income improves people's mental health. It reduces stress. And improving mental health, it also improves people's physical health. And that helps with reducing the demands on public health services and actually helps create a more healthy society. It also results in improved schooling. Where we've found, where we've seen basic income going to families, individuals, but individuals within families, the children go to school more conscientiously and achieve better results and stay in school longer and do better. We've also seen that basic income paid to each individual without condition, each individual man, individual woman, each child paid to the mother or the surrogate mother, 
results in improvement in the status of women. It improves their sense of freedom, their sense of being in control of their lives, and we have some dramatic results in that respect. And then listen to what I'm about to say, please. Contrary to the critic, people who have a basic income work more, not less. And they're more productive when they work. And they're more tolerant of other people. They're more altruistic towards other people. In short, they become better citizens. For me, the evidence is overwhelming. The results are independent of the involvement of someone like me. They've been done by independent groups, people without any views at the beginning. But again and again, the results come through. People who have basic security become better people. And that's what we should want for everybody, as well as for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, one last question. As you have aptly described it, uh, being part of the precariat feels like uh, running on sinking sand. You go nowhere and you have to run harder and harder. But despite all these difficulties, on the bright side, we've seen the emancipatory potential of the precariat as illustrated, for example, by young workers fighting to create new unions against all the union busting tactics and uh, having victories like they did with the Starbucks union in the US, for example. So my question is, what conditions facilitate, might facilitate this emancipatory potential of the precariat and what is the role of a new labor unionism? Yeah, that's a very good question. Clearly, you've, you've listened to some speech I've given because I think the, the, the idea that if you're in the precariat, you're running on sinking sand is a very nice metaphor of how many people feel. But I want to emphasize one point, Costas, which is this, that the precariat are not just victims. It's, they, they are not just failures. Increasingly, people in the precariat are proud. They don't feel ashamed. They don't feel that they are failures. They feel that this is a condition of an emerging class and there is dignity. And this gives them a sense of independence. They don't suffer from a false consciousness that jobs, 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 labor is somehow the route to nirvana. They feel they want to do work. They want to do commoning, as I call it. They want to care for their loved ones, for their community. They want to be creative. They want to develop themselves. And they want to slow down. That's why my new book is called The Politics of Time. They want to have sense of control of their time, which is the most vital asset we have besides our health. Our time is all we have. And they want to feel in control of their time and be able to use their time in ways that are outside the dictates of capital or the dictates of the state. We need the state, but it must be reformed. It must be re-emancipated from the control by finance and interests that are alien for ordinary people. And I think this sense of emancipation is, is vital for a new progressive politics. And when you talk about the unions, the unions have got to reform themselves. They have to transform their vocabulary. I was speaking to the International Confederation of Building Workers in Helsinki earlier this week. And I said, you are still using the vocabulary of the 1960s. 
You have to use the vocabulary that appeals to the precariat and there's a vision of quality and security in which we can flourish by developing our capacities and control, having a control of our time. And I was very heartened by the fact that a lot of the younger people in those trade unions and their members come from 70 countries, they came up to me afterwards and have been writing to me and saying, yes, we must go in this direction. I believe we need unions. We need collective bodies because we're all vulnerable. We need collective bodies that represent our interests, our ecological interests. Most fundamentally, we want to be ecological. We want to care for our environment. We want to feel part of our environment. That is why the agenda of eco-growth or degrowth is so attractive for the precariat. Why do we want to chase GDP growth all the time? Why do we want to produce more guns, which will raise GDP growth? Whereas if I care for my mother and don't get paid, GDP growth goes down. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. So we have to reorient the way we want to live and the way we measure progress. GDP goes up if finance becomes more powerful and gets more wealth through the financial markets. But has that improved the conditions of our living? No, of course not. So we have to think differently. I don't want to chase GDP growth. We have to have an image. Growth is a tumor inside us. Cancers have growth. Do we want growth all the time? No, not all the time. So this is a new agenda, a new way of looking at it. And the people in the precariat are in a position where they don't suffer the false consciousness of thinking that the model of capitalism in which we are living is the best possible world. It isn't. And that, I think, is the final point on which I would like to end our discussion because we have to be able to emancipate our imaginations, emancipate our vision, our vocabulary, and our courage. And that, I think, is happening among people in the precariat Particularly, I find women, because they're less suffering from this false consciousness that jobs, jobs, jobs is the road to heaven. So we have to follow what these people are saying to us. And I'm fortunate in I'm able to listen to a lot of them. So I thank you very much for this good question. Thank you. This was the first episode uh, of the Vidka series on precarity, uh, which is uh, part of Veteran's new project, uh, Youth Precarity. Stay tuned for more to come. <laughs>